What if your next team workshop delivered the results you hoped for? What if everyone believed that the working session was a valuable use of their time and felt inspired to take action? My name is Miriam Hapnes and it is my mission to help you to deliver workshops that work. Today with me on the show is Rain Sevenstern. Rain is a facilitator, coach and managing partner of experiential learning. He has lived in Australia, Russia, India, Malaysia, US, UK, Belgium and the Netherlands and has worked in most of these places as well. Today we're going to speak about the power of co-creation and the role of creating experiences for our participants. So stay tuned. Hello, Wayne. Hi, good morning. Good morning. You arrived with the Wayne today. I did indeed. <laughs> so... I guess this is just Amsterdam. It definitely is. Um, and it's actually not true what people think that you always get wet when you cycle in Amsterdam. Uh, it just happened to happen today. <laughs> and luckily we had some time to just dry. Yes, thank you for coffee. the towel. Yes. <laughs> and now we are ready and dry to get things started. I usually like to start with a question, especially when my guests have such an extensive experience and traveled throughout the world. So if you had to summarize yourself as a hashtag, what would you be? Go where the energy goes. Mm, what does make you say that? I think in Western society, we have a tendency to constantly plan everything mm. and to prepare for everything and then follow the plan or feel disappointed when we can't follow mm. the plan. And I believe very much that um, the energy is there for a reason and it guides you to where your best work can happen. Mm. So um, I apply that to myself as much as um, in the work I do with, uh, with our clients, um, teams and individuals. Um, we can plan a workshop from A to Z and then um, it can go completely different because the energy is asking for it mm -hmm. and the energy i mean what's the energy in the room um how where do people want to focus on and then i like to go where the energy is mm. it reminds me of the quote that life happens while you, we are making plans probably yes yeah. yes and um maybe an extension of that um in in the past i used to when i was much younger i used to really deliberate what I consider to be life-altering decisions. Like, should mm -hmm. I do this or should I do that? Should I uh, take this position or should I not? Or should I um, move to another country or not? And what I realized is that I don't believe in life-altering decisions anymore. Mm -hmm. There's just decisions and you experience what happens once you've made a decision and then mm -hmm. you can make another decision based on your experience. Yeah. I at one point just stopped doing regrets And this really helped me also to lose the fear of these life altering decisions. Because if you are not looking back and regretting something, then a decision is a decision and then you look forward. Well, that might be my next development step <laughs> because I still have regrets. <laughs> it. Well, no, I don't have regrets. No, you're right. But it's, it's, it's to not feel mm -hmm. regret mm -hmm. is different than choosing not to, to regret something. That's true. That's true. So as it seems, looking at your Vita, that the energy has taken you to many different places and cultures so far. And I would be curious to know what you've learned from experiencing all these cultural differences, working and living abroad. Yes. Well, the one thing that maybe I learned is that it's not so much the cultural differences that matter, but is the differences between people. Mm -hmm. And different cultures are just an aspect of what makes a person. I have indeed lived in many different countries. Um, I've also worked in other countries mm -hmm. than where I lived. So I've constantly been in, um, in, a, in, a, in a work environment that's very international. And um, what really helps to make a connection with people is being truly curious about who the person in front of you is, because they mm -hmm. all come with their own story. Mm -hmm. They all come with their own life experiences. And just because somebody's Chinese or somebody's German doesn't mean that they are all the things that you think of when mm -hmm. you think of the Chinese culture versus the German culture. Mm -hmm. So I am aware of these 
components and some of the things that might impact a person coming from a different culture. But I always start with exploring or at least finding out, being curious about who is the person in front of me and what's their life story. So can you keep all these stereotypes that we do have about cultures out of your mind when you travel to a new place? Or would you still have your toolbox of experiences and then adjust your facilitation style to the culture where you're traveling? I'm just, if I reflect back on, on, on my own experience in working in these, these different places, I, I, I can only imagine that I would have unconscious biases mm -hmm. like everybody. What I don't do is um, study the differences of culture. Mm. Um, in advance mm -hmm. um, because I do think that that might get in the way and then yeah. you start projecting what mm. you expect yeah. of this of this of this audience yeah and none of us wants to be put in this box of stereotypes yes. and if we can feel it and I, but I do yeah. pick up differences like an example is that when I was um, running workshops in India I was really amazed this was in Mumbai Uh, I was really amazed with how eager these people were to learn something new. Mm -hmm. They were really keen to learn, um, which was very different from the audiences I worked with or the clients I worked with in Australia, where mm -hmm. I was based at the time. That can be sometimes a bit blasé in terms of, well, we've been there, we've done that, we've heard it all mm -hmm. before. Here's another consultant who's come to tell us, you know, their newest model. Um, and I, I, I did feel that in India there was a different mindset about really curiosity to learn mm -hmm. new things. Another example is when I was in Russia, in Moscow, I was working with bankers and needing to... Um, I did, my mission was to introduce the concept of emotional intelligence mm -hmm. in this environment. Mm -hmm. And I really recall um, one of the first meetings where uh, I was meeting with the president and he had invited us over to come talk about emotional intelligence. and. It was very clear that this was um, an opportunity to employ us to roll out a program with a topic. Coming from where I was at the time, best practice was never to just be sending in this first meeting, but asking a lot of questions from the audience, involving mm -hmm. them. And I was baffled with the lack of response I got from the audience. Mm -hmm. And... All, there, was, there was the president plus maybe 10 other people in the meeting um, that all reported to this president. And each time, like, okay, so what's, what's, what are you currently experiencing? Or uh, what, are you, what, what is getting in the way? Uh, what is the reason behind wanting to embrace emotional intelligence? All these questions, to an extent, they were addressed by the president, but nobody else was giving any answers. And mm -hmm. that's because it's, they're so ingrained to be told rather than to be asked mm -hmm. what to do or what to think in, in, in that context. Now, these are uh, things I discovered from my experience, mm -hmm. and they can be explained also by the cultural heritage of okay. these different um, uh, countries. Um, but I'd rather just ex discover them based on experience because they also evolve. And my mm -hmm. impressions of people, or my no, not my impressions, but my... My, my observations or my uh, the, the, the things that I'm learning about different cultures also evolves. Mm -hmm. um, and I can, it, it really depends on, on your own situation as well, how you interact. So it's always important to stay connected with who you have in front of you and um, not trying to fall in the trap of uh, cultural stereotypes. How would you then open a meeting uh, or a workshop? What would be your warm-up exercise when you know that you're facing a group that maybe lacks curiosity or is used to another way of collaborating? Mm. Yes, so you can't do the same things for all the different groups. That's true. But I do also feel that um, when we are invited to run a workshop with our clients, there is a need for something to change. So um, the premise is that It's not going to be only comfortable for people. Mm -hmm. We're not here to keep you in your comfort zone. So mm -hmm. we want to invite you to step out of your comfort zone mm -hmm. as well. And depending on um, the topic or the, the, the theme that is going to be addressed, 
um, you can go further with that or not. For example, if it's a skill-based workshop that you're doing and they need to learn something new around a technique, mm -hmm. then you don't have to invite them too far out of the comfort zone that they start questioning mm -hmm. who they are. Whereas if it is much more about uh, building team cohesion, mm -hmm. then yes, it becomes more important to really look at yourself as well and you can, you can actually uh, push them further. Mm -hmm. So we, I would definitely, and I'm team, I, but I work with my two colleagues. Um, we're three people in the company uh, and we actually almost always co-facilitate because mm -hmm. it's so important to be able to, to work together and to calibrate what's happening in the moment. So you can be flexible and agile to cater to whatever is needed in the moment. So when I say I, I do mean uh, we, um, but because you're interviewing me, I'll talk about my own experience Please. well in this case we do we do really consider what is the uh, what are people there but we don't think in terms of cultures as much we mm -hmm. think about um what we know about these people and how willing they are to step out of their comfort zone or not one good way that we like to start any workshop is um by asking them doing a check-in and we use little cards for that with little mm -hmm. we call them emoticons mm -hmm. they're they're little um actually ghosts, I think, um, that have different expressions. One is like under the carpet, the other one is laying on his back in a hammock and the third one is running uh, to the top of, a, of, a, uh, of, of, of something. Uh, so they're very um, intuitive little uh, characters mm -hmm. and there is literally, there's hundreds of them that we have and we just spread them out over the floor and we ask people to just pick um, very intuitively, one or two cards uh, from these images that represent how they are feeling being here mm -hmm. in this moment. The reason why we do this, and we often ask people, you know, afterwards, why do you think we do this? Is that often when you ask somebody, how are you today? What you get is fine, because mm -hmm. that's the socially conventional mm -hmm. answer. You don't go any deeper. You don't reveal anything about yourself. If you have a card and you need to say why you chose that card, then you are much more likely to open up and give at least a little bit more than just fine or, or okay. Um, and you can say, I chose this card because I feel this or I think this. And then you mm -hmm. get a little bit more information. That's how you start getting people to open up yeah. and disclose something about themselves, which is actually something that's very important in the work that we do. It's funny, I, um, in the solo show I recorded recently, I was exactly reflecting on that, that it's easier to talk about an image or a picture, a photograph, than about our own emotions. That's also what triggers conversations so easily in a museum. T talking about our emotions reflected in yes. a painting that we yes. see, for instance. Because it, like deep in a way, it, it can feel too vulnerable to expose, say, I feel this. Mm -hmm. But if you can sort of project it onto an image, mm -hmm. then it's like, okay, I chose this. Yeah. And it depersonalizes in a way which lowers the threshold for people to start opening up. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. And you mentioned your business and that you're wanting the the three of you together yes and the name is experiential learning correct so what is experiential learning okay well experiential learning we chose the name because um it's really captures what we're all about it's about growing and developing by making by you making the most out of the experiences you have which is different than imparting information Mm -hmm. telling people mm -hmm. or teaching people it's different than training a little a new trick or mm -hmm. even a new skill it's about experiencing that you go through and reflecting on them and we all do that mm -hmm. we all do that anyway in life if you look at how people learn and some people learn by studying and then thinking about it and then applying it other people say okay I've got a new iPhone. I'm not going to read a booklet. I'm just going to try all kinds mm -hmm. of different buttons and see what happens. So we have all these different preferences. However, what in traditional ways of learning has been much more, um, getting much more attention is imparting knowledge or has been um, uh, uh, exercising new skills or practicing mm -hmm. new skills. 
and very little actually reflecting on experience. Mm -hmm. That's always been sort of the, um, like an afterthought. And we feel that um, an experience, going through an experience, is something that you can take with you for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. It's a memory that you can take with you. It's about sustainable learning. Mm -hmm. So going through an experience stays sticks longer than being taught something. The other thing is why it's why we chose um, to focus on experiences is that building proximity between people mm -hmm. or making people connect or get, getting people to understand each other or liking each other or getting along with each other is based on shared experiences. Mm -hmm. So if you collectively go through these learning experiences, it also helps building um, collaboration and trust between people mm -hmm. because you've all been through the same kinds of experiences. So um, what we do as a business is that we help our clients and they can be big organizations that go through a major transformation or they can be individuals that mm -hmm. um, have a specific development need. We help them to bridge those gaps, development gaps, by creating, designing and creating experiences for them and then facilitate the maximum learning out of these. Now, when we say experiences, it doesn't mean that they're tailor-made experiences. Sometimes it can actually be very powerful to make more use of the day-to-day -day experience that our clients are going through. For example, um, this was last year, um, a, a, a leadership team, an executive team, was facing a major transformation in their organization. Mm -hmm. And this required a different way of operating as a leadership team. One of the key things was um, to, to really start operating as a one team rather than a group of individuals, mm -hmm. each with their own responsibilities. Now, what worked best here was to really look at their day-to-day -day experience and then adding the learning to it. What I mean there in concrete terms is that we would join them on mm -hmm. their strategic offsites, mm -hmm. where they would be working together on the plan ahead for the rollout of this transformation. And the contract was that we would have moments in between their regular work, working on the content, on the task, mm -hmm. to do a timeout and review the, the experience they were having at the time and what it meant for, their, uh, for them as individuals and for becoming mm -hmm. one team. Usually experiences are something very personal, individual. So sitting in the same situation, the same room, objectively we're in the same situation, but personally we, our experience of that is totally different. Yes. So I can only think of an awkward dating situation where one is super enthusiastic and thinks that this is the perfect date and the other person is actually totally bored. Yeah. And again, it boils down to talking about feelings a lot. Because talking about our experience, how we experience a situation, especially in the context of a strategy offsite, can also be vulnerable. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the mission is to become from a group of individuals to become a team that really operates as one team. Mm -hmm. Now, what does it take? What's the difference? The difference is that a group working together means that they at best consult each other, inform each other, they collaborate and they each have their own agenda, mm -hmm. basically. And the agendas in the best instance are aligned so they can, you know, there can be some synergies or they can leverage off the work that the other does. But it's not necessary to have one agenda to be successful. Now to become a real team, big difference is that the individual agendas take second place. Mm. And the common agenda or the common purpose takes pride of place. And that requires to relinquish some of your ego, your mm. own agenda, mm -hmm. for in, in favor of the common agenda of the team. So there needs, first of all, there needs to be a clear common purpose that's appealing to everybody. The second criteria is that no individual can be successful as an individual. Mm -hmm. They can only be successful in achieving this purpose as a team. So they need each other. Those are the, 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 the key conditions mm -hmm. to start with. Then, in order to make it function, you need to work on the individual's egos. 
mm. or the individuals, um, yeah, call it egos, actually. What helps people to relinquish some of their own agenda is trust. Mm -hmm. Trust for, for us is, 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 is a key ingredient and in it's prime ingredient for building a real team. Mm -hmm. um, trust is also a big word. How do you build trust? It's, it's not something actually that you can construct. It's mm -hmm. something that, that develops over time. But if you look at it from um, a perspective, and, and, and uh, Meister did a very good job in, um, in his work uh, around trust, what, to become a trusted advisor. We, we use that, his work uh, quite extensively. And one of the key ingredients in how to build trust is to um, work on proximity. Mm -hmm proximity between people and then we go back to the shared experiences mm -hmm. it's not about becoming friends but at least being interested in each other as a whole person mm -hmm. not just as a colleague on the team uh, not just around what do you do and what is your role what is your what are your tasks and what are my tasks but really understanding where the person is coming from and building empathy absolutely it's about building empathy and also disclosing about yourself. It's, it's a two-way thing. And when you say disclosing about yourself and you mentioned your own agenda slash ego, how important is it in this framework that each team member acknowledge their own ego and their own agenda and that the group reflects upon that? It is important to get there, but it's not... I don't think it is best practice to, to, to do that head on mm -hmm. by asking everybody, okay, come on, put all the egos on the table because that's not going to work. So you need, it's something that you need, to, uh, you need to develop over time. And one of the things you asked me, what's, what is one of your favorite exercises? Yeah. One of them is uh, that really works on proximity. Um, we call it the valuable object. Mm -hmm. We facilitate this exercise Uh, um, often in settings like with the executive team where they need to start building trust between people. And um, it's something that we do not as part of the work day, but we do it at the end of the day, preferably when there's an overnight stay somewhere mm -hmm. around a campfire would be ideal. Um, in this case, we did do it around a campfire. We were lucky there was actual uh, fires outside at the hotel where we were staying. And... Um, the people are briefed before they go is to bring an object that has significance for them, mm. a valuable object. We don't tell them what's going to happen, but we said just bring one. Then at the exercise, the invitation is we all sit in a circle and the invitation is to reveal your object um, and tell, explain to the group why this is of significant for, significance for you can be a photograph it can it can be anything um mm -hmm. we've had somebody bring in baby clothes from their firstborn child and that wow. they kept for example and all kinds of very personal things so they 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 share the object with the group they reveal why it's valuable for them and then we go one step further we ask them to hand it over to a colleague for safekeeping wow. so they entrust the object to a colleague nice. and they need to look after it for the duration of the workshop so at the closing of the workshop that's when we hand back the uh, valuable objects but it's actually the, the entrusting something yes. really valuable about yourself yeah. to a colleague which is so powerful and even talking about it now I get I get, really get goosebumps because some, some of these stories that you hear are so personal mm. um, and so not related to how they know each other uh, at the workplace um, and and so it's it works both on sharing something very personal mm. and also giving trust to yeah. somebody and it's amazing also how the effect it it gives to people receiving an object mm -hmm like to being trusted. Mm. So those experiences help to build proximity and start building trust. And once you go through these experiences as a team, it becomes much more easy to start um, sharing more stuff and entrusting each other in the workplace as well. Very inspiring. Thank you for sharing that. And I would be interested 
whether you then frame the moment of giving back this object. Do you build a ritual around it? Because I can imagine that this is a very emotional moment where you're receiving back your valuable object that someone else kept for you. We actually choose not to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's because the, the experience in the moment when they're sharing their objects is very powerful um, mm -hmm. and that stands on its own. We do ensure that the objects get returned, mm -hmm. but that's much more private between the two people that have shared their objects. Um, and we don't want to... It, it, yeah, maybe it, it, it is, there's a chance of an anticlimax by trying mm -hmm. to... Uh, Force it. Yeah, and, and also to uh, emulate the experience mm -hmm. around the campfire because it's very significant. Mm. And the campfire actually comes back to a lot of our programs. Um, we also have a symbolic campfire that we often do on the longer term development programs. So this, is, this was an executive team where the experience that we used was their task at hand, mm -hmm. the strategy that needed to be rolled out. Um, and we added some of our own experiences like the valuable object and others as well. We use this, this um, symbol of the campfire in those kind of programs where at the end of each day, um, and these are often taking place, these programs in seminar rooms um, and in some kind of venue. And we close, there's this ritual that we use each day to close the working day is where we shade the room. So the room becomes all dark. Mm -hmm. We place candles in a circle in the middle of the room and all participants in that program sit around these candles and really zoom in to themselves. So this is about connecting with yourself. And it's also about mindfulness, to be honest. Mm -hmm. It's about being present in the moment. Mind, yeah. The invitation then is there's, there's a talk stick in the middle to take the talk stick if you want to share something. Mm -hmm. And what you want to share in the moment can be anything. What's important to you. People take turns and they grab the stick, start talking by saying rain, checking in. I feel or I think or I need my hope is whatever I want to share. Rain checking out and I place the talk toy in the middle mm -hmm. again. All of this happens in silence, in darkness, and takes as much time as needed. You don't have to share anything, but we do require everybody to take the talk stick, check in and check out when you're mm -hmm. done. And what you do in the middle is up to you. What this does is really helps people to, because um, behaviors and, and emotions are contagious. Mm -hmm. So one person sharing really triggers thoughts with the other person that might start sharing as well. And people start building on, on each other. And you see in a progression over the closings of the, of the week that we, that we go through that these um, rituals become more and more profound. Mm -hmm. And it's another way of experiencing, connecting with yourself and opening up and sharing and the effect it has on other people. And listening without judgment. Yes. Because yes. there's no discussion. There's, there's no, no discussion. commenting. It's pure silence. Yeah. When you want to share something, you take the talk stick, you check in, you say what you want to share, and you check out. And then the next person, when they're ready, yeah. takes it. I experienced a similar outcome even without the candlelight and without talk stick, just doing the regular checkout every evening over my last project that lasted 10 days. Yeah. And in the beginning, especially the more senior people in the team, they didn't like it. And at the end, they required it. And they even called in the team on the very last day after we finished the project just for a final checkout. And it was so emotional. Yeah. It was very intense. And it just showed how how addictive it actually is to share the experience or share reflections about the experience in this environment without judgment. Yes. And while you're here, let me introduce my favorite workshop planning tool, Session Lab. 
Raina and I were actually just discussing that we cannot imagine working without it anymore. So if you're still juggling with Word or Excel tables to build your workshop agenda, check this out. Session Lab is an intuitive drag and drop agenda builder that automatically adjusts the timing and keeps all information about your workshop in one place. I do remember the days when I feared any last minute changes because that meant readjusting tables and recalculating times. There were so many opportunities for mistakes and so much time to waste. Did your client change the timing? With Session Lab, you adjust it with only one click. Did you decide to switch to blocks? Drag and drop them to their new slots. Session Lab is designed for facilitators and will save you time and headaches as it did for me. Stop messing with spreadsheets and focus on designing workshops that work. Try the free version on sessionlab.com. I don't plan any more meetings or workshops without. You mentioned the comfort zone yeah. a couple of times that you like to bring your participants out of the comfort zone. So you need to create a joint comfort zone or a trusting zone where everyone feels empowered to leave it yeah. or their person. How do you bridge this gap or how do you see this yeah. opposition? Um, and it's a very good one um, because it's different for everybody. Mm. Um, there's two things that are important here. One is one that you already mentioned yourself, which is about being non-judgmental. That's really important is to, to contract um, and make some ground rules about judgment mm -hmm. um, in, in, the, um, in the workshop, at the beginning of the workshop. And that's the obvious one. Um, it's the Vegas rule that uh, that's most people know. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, but it actually goes much further than that. It's it's about being able to remain curious about the other person um, without judging. Mm -hmm. And that's that's more difficult to do. So it's about um, respecting. It's about um, exploring. Um, and, and participating in the discussion and, and really being curious about what the other person is saying. This is something that you can contract up front and that as facilitators we need to definitely manage. How can you manage that? How can you get someone to participate without them feeling judged? Well, um, there was also a second thing that I hadn't mentioned yet, which for, for us means... Um, out of comfort is a big, is a big thing. There's, there's, there's a big world out of comfort zone. Mm -hmm. um, we like to cut it down to what is, um, what is a stretch and mm -hmm. what's a stress situation. Mm -hmm. So, stress situation is where people feel out of comfort, but it stresses them, which really um, stops them from being open, from being willing to explore from being open to making mistakes um, and actually really it's it's it evokes responses like fight or flight or freeze. animal instincts as animal as instincts less stress. Less stress so you want to avoid the stress mm -hmm. uh, stress zone then there is a, in between the comfort zone and stress zone there is the stretch mm -hmm. zone and the problem well not a problem but the the interesting thing is that this is different for everybody The only person who can do that is the person themselves, because it is different for everybody. Um, so it's important to contract up front on uh, being able to express mm -hmm. when you're reaching your stress zone or when you, you know, when you're no longer in your stretch. Um, and it's also important to contract up front by agreeing that, okay, we're not here to all be fabulous and to all do a brilliant job and, and uh, only focus on, on how well we do things or, or what we're good at, but we're here to learn. So it's about really experimenting and trying something, try, trying out something new mm. and trusting and empowering the people to indicate when they're in their stretch and when they're out, you know, beyond their stretch mm -hmm. into stress. And this is about something that is truly about um, allowing or helping people to take accountability for that themselves. Yeah, to set boundaries. 
Do you have a sort of sign that the participants would use? Kind of a sound or a red flag? Could, it, could, or it could be, yeah, it, it, we've used cards and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, and sometimes it's very helpful. Um, it, I don't think it's necessary because we don't use it all the time. Um, it, it's about uh, checking in with, with the group and checking in with individual participants and basically allowing the space or creating the space by an intervention as a facilitator uh, just by asking, so what's going on here? How does this, how, what's the impact on you or what mm -hmm. just happened? By creating a space, um, it often helps people to just start talking about what's happening. And I just need to mention that because I love the way how you phrase it. What is the impact on you, what's currently happening, as opposed to how does it make you feel? Because I realize that especially senior male participants often feel don't feel comfortable about talking about their feeling. And then they start eye rolling as soon as you ask them, so how do you feel about this exercise? But what is the impact of this exercise on you? It puts it on a more rational level. And that's very true. And I actually like to come back to something you said earlier about so important to share feelings when mm -hmm. you're working on proximity. Um, and I forgot to, to uh, challenge you on that because I think feelings can sometimes be overrated as well mm -hmm. because there's much more than just feelings it's important emotions are extremely important there's no interaction between people without emotions having uh, a play but it, there's different layers in that there is thoughts that occur mm -hmm. there is beliefs that get triggered mm -hmm. there is uh, convictions there is um interpretations, assumptions, mm -hmm. all these values are very big and uh, important. These are all actually constructs that we create in our mind mm -hmm. on, a, on a more cognitive level. And the feelings, they come, they, they are actually um, feeding those, those constructs, but they go hand in hand. So it's, it's, it's to stay closer to the reality of where people are, it sometimes is, works very well to address Of thoughts mm -hmm. and ideas and convictions before you get to the feelings so mm. what's the impact of what just happened on you is a starting point um, what you could ask as a follow-up question is that okay so what what thoughts did you have mm -hmm. at the time yeah. or what was your uh, what was your thinking yeah. or uh, what went through your mind or even the physical tension yes Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, because often if you, if you address the feeling question too soon, people that you are asking the question, how do you feel? They will answer, well, I was thinking this. So they'll mm -hmm. go there anyway. Yeah. So I think it's important to know where, where feeling comes in explicitly and yeah. where it makes a difference to address the feeling. Yeah. Um, or where it's the thought or the conviction or the belief or the value that somebody has which also puts us more in control of our own feelings and not let our beliefs, our convictions, as you just said, trigger feelings that actually are misplaced anyway in this context or very That's often. very true. That's very true. Um, and that has to do with the way our brain is functioning mm -hmm. and the way it's evolved over time. Mm -hmm. We have the reptilian brain with um, the amygdala, which mm -hmm. is the, the control center of, uh, of emotions. And we have the neocortex, mm -hmm. which is the part of the brain that can rationalize and can uh, reason. And I read somewhere once that um, we, we are like uh, animals um, in the sense that we have the reptilian instincts still in our, in our brain. Um, we also have the social instincts from, from, from mammals, for example. Um, but what makes a difference between um, uh, an autonomous, rationally operating human and an animal is that we can reason. Mm -hmm. And apparently, just by reflecting and naming what you feel, yeah. it can already help you to 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 manage the emotional yeah. response yeah that's what we learn in meditation right? 
Oh, you? I don't know about that. That's, I'd like to hear from that. But Well, this would be another episode as such, <laughs> maybe. But uh, what I, I learned from Vipassana meditation especially is to, to get a better sense of physical reactions to what is happening and then to name it and then before reacting. Depending on whether it was my ego affected or my emotions, my yeah, my emotions affected, I felt it at different points. Mm. So when the ego, then I felt it in my stomach. So I got angry and there was some yeah physical reaction in my stomach. Whereas when it was more on a personal level and I really cared, then it was more in the chest. Okay. So and this helped me then to also moderate my reaction to this mm. because when i felt okay it's my stomach then I'll, it's on me to let go when i felt it on the chest oh this seems to be important to me so i better address it ah well that's actually that's that's a very good point that you're making because this is about not relying on external um or like somebody else mm. to give you the sign or to give you the space yeah. to reflect on it but following your own physical sensations or, mm. or signals um, I did Vipassana as well, and I never got that far in my uh, in my learning. Um, so maybe I should revisit um, um, that experience. I planned my next one for end of August, so I'm excited. Wow, Number impressive. Three. Yeah. So let's see where this takes me. But talking about taking <laughs> somewhere to places and following energy. In the conversation we had to when we first met to, um, before preparing this podcast... You shared with me about this awesome project you're doing for your clients where you take potential talents or future leaders from different countries and you bring them to a developing country. Can you tell us more about that? Absolutely. It's uh, a concept um, that was conceived by one of my colleagues um, and actually was the foundation for uh, experiential learning. Um, and the concept is to learn about yourself by taking yourself out of your given frame of reference. Mm -hmm. um, so it's bridging different worlds, if you want. The way it works is that we have a couple of clients that we run these programs with. They select a group of um, uh, promising uh, talents that they want to um, help in the transition to become global leaders rather than, for example, local leaders in, in their units. These people come from all over the world. They have different uh, functions. They have different roles. An IT manager from China, a uh, marketing manager from uh, Brazil, um, and uh, maybe an operations manager from Germany. And so there's like 30 of these people why are you laughing? Because is it operations in Germany or? Yeah, in marketing in Brazil. And so ah, it was very so funny. Actually talking you're... about stereotypes. Yeah, you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. I like that. <laughs> I know, I, that's actually, you know, that must be an unconscious bias <laughs> because I, yeah, it's definitely unconscious. Um, anyway, so, so they select these people based on their um, willingness and eagerness to learn, ability to learn and being ready for a next step. They come together with us in, uh, for a week's, uh, week-long leadership expedition. And the mission is that um, this is all the prep work that's being done. Um, they partner with an NGO that has... Uh, it needs to be an NGO of some substance because what they need to be able to provide is some strategic challenges that... Um, are critical for the um, the continuation or the sustainability of the NGO. For example, um, in Romania, we were um, working with Habitat for Humanity, um, and they one of the key challenges was how do we become financially independent from the global organization mm -hmm. of Habitat um, and really increase our local funding? Um, how do we win except for the, the hands, also the hearts of our volunteers. And so they had some, some key strategic challenges that were important for their future survival in Romania. Mm -hmm. 
the the people from the clients or these uh, high potentials or, 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 or senior talents um, basically function as a group of consultants in collaboration with um, some leaders of the NGO mm -hmm. and are divided up in, in teams of 10, eight people from the organization that's, that, that's our client plus um, a couple of people from the NGO and they address one theme each during the whole week. Mm -hmm. um, what this does is that um, as a participant, not only um, take the, the example I just had, the IT manager from, uh, from China um, has to work with the marketing manager from Brazil um, in one team um, and address a topic that's completely out of their frame of reference. So the, the, the task is very, uh, you can't rely on what you know, you can't mm. rely on your expertise. You need to really uh, apply yourself as a person to mm -hmm. the job to come up with some um, meaningful outcome. Because that's the key at the end of this expedition. The, each team needs to come up with a recommendation for the NGO that's presented to the board um, that needs to be relevant, uh, implementable, practical, mm -hmm. and needs to basically they need to be able to start rolling it out from day one. Mm -hmm. So they need to deliver real business value to the NGO. In going through this experience together, um, also with the, the, the people from the NGO, the facilitators, and that's us, we help them to take the, mo the most leadership learnings out of the experience. Mm -hmm. So basically, um, the, the expedition, the six days, is divided up in the first day is forming the teams, second day is an immersion into the reality of the client, mm -hmm. and then day three, four, and five, they need to work together as a team. And those days are divided up in different slots, with a different leader mm -hmm. each time. Mm. So they work, so the leader then needs to lead the team on the task and they're completely self-managing. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no structure for that. There's no plan for that. They are responsible for the job to be done and taking it for, further. Um, and it's like it's like a relay relay race. So mm -hmm. they it's, it's like an estafette almost. So mm -hmm. they, they each leader needs to hand over the, the 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 stick to the next leader and then pass it on. Yeah. And there, so as a leader, you become a team member in mm -hmm. your next slot, and the team member can become a leader in the in the in the in the following slot. So that's the structure of the program. And each of those slots, which lasts only an hour and a half, so your your okay. leader. That's high pace. It's yeah, very high pace um, because we have te 10 people that each yeah. need to be a leader in three days or so three or four days. Um, so you've got an hour and a half, but a lot of things can happen in an hour and a half yeah. in real time. It's, yeah. it's, it's amazing what happens in the teams in an hour and a half. Um, and as facilitators, we observe, we're there. Um, we sometimes can intervene if we see something happening that's significant for the learning. But basically they do their thing during that time and then each leadership slot is followed by a debrief mm -hmm. in which um, the leader gets feedback from all its his his or her teammates um, facilitated in a group discussion mm -hmm. and it sounds repetitive but the thing is that it's very high paced and as we go through um, we really help the team to 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 uh, improve the quality of their feedback um, we provide some, in plenary sessions, some inputs around different leadership concepts. Um, so they start applying, so they have experiences, we make sense of the experiences and we frame them with mm -hmm. overall concepts that they can apply in the next leadership slot again. Yeah. So it's a very high paced, very experiential mm -hmm. um, learning um, on a high level. Yeah. And I think it's awesome. I can imagine all the benefits, not only for the NGO, obviously for the team, for their learning. And you highlighted before that it's important to provide some sustainability for the project, the NGO project they're working on. 
And talking about sustainability, I'm now wondering how can you assure that they're actually taking these learnings, this experience in leadership and implement it back in their home environments where basically they're the only ones who experienced that? You say that and it's, they're not the only ones that experience it because what, what this does in terms of viral change, um, it creates little circles of change mm -hmm. in the, in the uh, mother organization, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, because these programs are conducted one or two a year over a okay. series of years. Mm -hmm. um, so these, all these people go through this and some people actually say it's been a life altering experience i bet yeah um so th and uh, they create a community amongst mm. themselves uh, they organize reunions um a very important follow-up is the ngo after a few months or after half a year coming back to the original group and debriefing on what's mm -hmm. happened with the recommendations and what has changed um and it's 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 very much uh as I said earlier, the experiences that you take with you mm -hmm. and that you remember. Um, and a good way to make it sustainable is to facilitate the dissemination of those experiences mm -hmm. in the organization. So one of the things that um, is a prerequisite of participation to the program is to become an ambassador mm -hmm. afterwards. Um, and that's an ambassador in terms of um, the leadership behaviors that um, are being promoted through uh, through this uh, this program um, things like collaboration delegation mm -hmm. or, uh, providing trust developing others customer centricity and being an ambassador doesn't mean that you profess these behaviors but you role model these behaviors mm -hmm. so they that's one of the things and at the end of a program each participant um, agrees on a personal mission and an ambassador mission mm. so a personal mission is this is what i commit to doing in the next three to six months mm -hmm. in terms of a change in my behavior as a leader of the organization and they choose a buddy to um accountability yes to hold to to, to check in on them and to to help them to to stick to their mission um, and they also do a mission around what they're going to do in the next six months to promote and to role model the leadership behaviors mm. in the rest of the organization. This is a beautiful, I think, food for thought to end our conversation. Before ending, though, I realized that I haven't asked one question that I usually always ask, which is what makes workshops fail? Ah. What makes workshops fail, I would say, is a lack of framing. What a lot of, I think, people in the profession, and, and I included, uh, facilitators, consultants or coaches, what we sometimes fall in the trap of planning all the things, what will make sense, mm -hmm. and then also thinking about how to do it, forgetting to be explicit about why, mm -hmm. why we do these things. And it's not because we need to fill in the why, but we need to contract with the client why this makes mm -hmm. sense. And how the interventions that we facilitate or, or conduct, how they can contribute to the purpose of the team. Yeah. Uh, it's not about running a beautiful workshop because these are all good things to do. Yes, they're all good things to do and everybody can learn from it. But it's very important to link it to what was the purpose of this mm -hmm. team, what's the purpose of the organization, and why is it important to get together and do the exercises, um, conduct the experiences, yeah. um, uh, follow the, the work plan as proposed. Yeah. We need to have that framing and be very explicit about it. Good point. If someone of the listeners fell asleep after minute one, just woke up, realized, oh my goodness, I missed the entire show. What do I need to know? What would it be? Oh, um, I would say, uh, yeah, um, I think what is important is prepare, prepare, prepare uh, and 
do a lot of the investment up front about why are we doing this, what are we going to be doing, and even how or what are the different things that we can, uh, the, the, the tools that we have in our backpack to, to, to achieve what we set out to do. Do all that work and then be able to let go of everything. Because the energy in the end of what happens in the room is going to be much more valuable to use than all the things you've prepared. So the preparation is there so that you can be flexible and agile to provide what is required in the moment in the room. To create experiences. Yes, meaningful experiences. Meaningful experiences. That are relevant and that stick. Great. If now someone wants to reach out to you to work with you, to book an experience with you, yes, how can they reach you? Well, the best way is to... The only problem is that we chose a name that says exactly what we do, but it's very hard to spell. So it's experientiallearning.biz. That's our website. And I will put it in the show notes so that everyone can reach you. Yes, so the email address is, is R-E-I-N, that's my name, rain at experientiallearning.biz. And my two colleagues, Natya and Natalie, have the same, well, not the same address, it's a different, different address, but the same construct. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time and all this input, Rain. It was a pleasure. I it was really. I enjoyed our conversation. I cannot imagine how quickly the time was just dissolving. I have no idea. And it's, it's thanks to your great interviewing skills, I could, lost complete track of time. That's perfect. That's how it should be. Thank you. Thank Enjoy you. Enjoy your weekend. Thanks. Thank you for staying tuned and listening to the show. I appreciate your attention as I know how busy you are. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe and engage by sharing your comments and thoughts and visit workshops.org to download the one-page summary. I'm looking forward to seeing you back at the next episode and I wish you a fruitful day.